After strolling through Kensington Gardens and past the Round Pond, you can see Kensington Palace, which has been a residence of the British royal family since the 17th century. From the outside, it doesn't strike you as being a palace, but as you'll see in a minute, the inside is quite palatial. Kensington Palace was originally a two-story mansion built by Sir George Coppin in 1605 in the village of Kensington. The mansion was purchased in 1619 by the first Earl of Nottingham and was then known as Nottingham House. Shortly after William and Mary assumed the throne as joint monarchs in 1689, they began searching for a residence better suited for the comfort of the asthmatic William. King William and Queen Mary asked Christopher Wren, the architect of St. Paul's Cathedral, to turn Nottingham House into a palace. His extension is largely what you see today. The clerk of works was told to do the job quickly and cheaply, so that's why Kensington Palace was built with bricks rather than stone. It was completed in six months, and William and Mary moved in on Christmas Eve, 1689. Over the next few years, the couple added a gallery, the Queen's apartments, and a new entrance. Tragically, Mary didn't have long to enjoy her new palace, because she died from smallpox in 1694. In 1702, William fell off his horse, broke his collarbone, and died a few days later. We're going to start with the modern royals, which of course includes perhaps the most loved modern royal, Princess Diana, who lived here from 1981 until her death in 1997. The King's Staircase leads to the King's State Apartments. It was decorated by William Kent and was completed around 1726. All of the elite climbed these stairs to visit the King, but could only enter if their clothes and jewels were acceptable to the guards. The King's Gallery was built in 1700 for William III. He would meet with his spies and plan his military campaigns here. In 1694, Robert Morden made the wind dial, which was attached to a weather vane on the roof. The wind dial was helpful to the king because he could see if the wind would allow an invasion fleet to come up the English Channel. William Kent transformed the gallery by 1725 as the green velvet was replaced by red damask. Kent and his assistants painted the seven large ceiling paintings, which showed scenes from the life of Ulysses. Kent also designed the picture frames. Most of the paintings were Italian and dated from the 16th and 17th centuries. It was in this room that King William caught the chill that led to his death in 1702. The Coppola Room is the most decorated room in the palace, and this is where George II and Queen Caroline hosted lavish parties. William Kent decorated the room and made it look like a Roman palace. This is a clock and music box. It was completed in 1743 and was bought by Princess Augusta. The king's drawing room would be full of people who came to the king's parties in search of power and prestige. The king's bedchamber was next door, and at some point, he'd come out and make an appearance. Guests would form a circle, hoping to speak with him. This room was the site of a famous royal argument in 1735. While King George was away, Queen Caroline reorganized the paintings and took down many of the Italian paintings that George loved. When he returned, he insisted that the Italian paintings be put back. The presence chamber is where the king would sit on his throne under a crimson silk damask throne canopy. Elite guests would be shown in to bow and kiss the king's hand. Before we see the royal queen's apartments, let's take a look at some spectacular jewels. We're going to see Queen Victoria's emerald necklace, earrings, brooch, and tiara. We'll also see jewelry from Queen Victoria's granddaughter, Princess Louise, including her diamond tiaras.
The Queen's Gallery, also known as the Long Gallery, is where Queen Mary was able to showcase her passion for collecting Asian treasures. There are 150 pieces of oriental porcelain in this room alone, and you can see some over the fireplace. Mary was crowned queen at the age of 28, and in 1677, she married her older cousin William, who was twice her age. William was from the Netherlands, and it was there that Mary developed her passion for collecting treasures from Asia. Mary also used the gallery for recreation, and it was often filled with ladies-in-waiting working on their embroidery. There were bird cages and red velvet set up in the windows and velvet cushions on the floor for her dogs. The Queen's bedroom was once a room where Queen Mary entertained friends, but prior to that it was her bedroom. In 1691, the Queen added an additional bedchamber, so this room wasn't needed anymore as a bedroom. The bed displayed here is thought to be the bed in which James Edward Stuart, son of King James II, was born at St. James's Palace in 1688. The Privy Chamber was one of Queen Caroline's favorite entertaining rooms. The ceiling painting depicts the Roman gods Mars, the god of war, and Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, surrounded by emblems representing the arts and sciences. Mars represented King George, and Minerva represented Queen Caroline. The painting was done by William Kent in 1722. The paneling in the Queen's dining room is from the 17th century. In this room, William and Mary would share private dinners of fish and beer, and Mary would take tea here. The portrait over the mantelpiece isn't of a queen or princess, it's of a much beloved housekeeper, Catherine Elliot. Catherine had been nurse to the infant James II, Mary's father, and later served as a court dresser and woman of the bedchamber to both his wives. Mary II had originally filled the Queen's drawing room with porcelain in 1694. In 1940, during World War II, a bomb damaged the room and destroyed the paneling, so it was replaced by the wallpaper that we see today. Queen Caroline's closet is a small room with a lot of history. Originally, it was William III's little bedchamber. George I used this room to store books, but they were removed after Queen Caroline discovered in 1727 many important drawings that were hidden in a cabinet. She put up 300 small paintings, miniatures, and embroideries in this room. By the end of the 18th century, they had been moved to other royal homes, and the room was converted to make dressing rooms for the Duchess of Kent and a bathroom for Princess Victoria. It was in this room that Queen Anne, Mary's younger sister, had a terrible argument with her childhood friend and confidant, Sarah Churchill, Duchess of Marlborough in 1711. As a result of the argument, Sarah and her husband were stripped of their high-ranked positions. Well, I hope you enjoyed the tour of Kensington Palace. Thanks for watching. Since the coronation of William the Conqueror in 1066, Westminster Abbey has hosted every coronation of British royalty, including Queen Elizabeth II in 1953. The Abbey is a symbol of the connection between church and state. And this is the Cathedral of Royalty. So the building you see today is from roughly the 13th century, mid 13th century. Princess Di, to her funeral service was held here. Princess William and Kate Middleton, Princess, Prince William and Kate Middleton were married here. And not only are kings and queens buried here, but you have Sir Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, and Charles Dickens, just to name a few, are also buried here. Westminster Abbey, formerly titled the Collegiate Church of St. Peter at Westminster, is a Gothic Abbey church. According to tradition, a church was founded at the site in the 7th century. The building itself was a Benedictine monastic church until a monastery was dissolved in 1539. Between 1540 and 1556, the abbey had the status of a cathedral. Since 1560, the building was no longer an abbey or a cathedral, having instead the status of a Church of England Royal Peculiar, a church responsible directly to the head of state. The monks once lived in the cloisters, which date from the 13th and 14th centuries. 
A memorial fountain in the cloister courtyard commemorates Lancelot Capability Brown, an 18th century English landscape artist. Hey, it's Lady Crumb. The cloisters contain the graves of several abbots of the Norman church and also some clergymen and officials of the church, such as organists and workmen. Also, some actors and actresses who were not allowed to be buried in the main church. And those people are buried underneath the abbey, so they're actually buried here. The remains are here. Uh, The Pick's chamber dates from 1065 to 1090. The room was used as a royal treasury. In the early 14th century, its altar was a workbench on which the annual trial of the Picts, which measured the silver content of their coinage, was carried out. The medieval tile floor dates from the 13th century. While this is a coronation church, not all coronations have gone smoothly since the first one in 1066. At the coronation of William I in 1066, when the crowd inside shouted their loud approval, the soldiers outside thought that a riot had broken out and set fire to the surrounding buildings. William became frightful and asked the Archbishop of York to complete the ceremony as quickly as possible. At the coronation of George IV, the crowd outside the abbey got a laugh when the king's estranged wife Caroline tried to enter the abbey and was locked out. At Queen Victoria's coronation, the Archbishop tried to force the ring onto the wrong finger of the Queen and she winced in pain. Having learned from past mistakes, when Queen Elizabeth II was coronated in 1953, the ceremony was very well rehearsed and went off without a hitch. In the Middle Ages, the choir was the scene of a vicious murder. During that time, criminals could seek sanctuary in the abbey. Once they were inside, the law could not touch them. In 1378, 50 of the king's men ignored the rule of sanctuary and chased a prisoner into the abbey. One of the soldiers dispatched of the prisoner and a monk who tried to rescue the prisoner. Westminster Abbey has been the burial site of more than 3,300 persons, usually prominent Brits, including at least 16 monarchs, 8 prime ministers, poet laureates, actors, scientists, military leaders, and the unknown warrior. We are now going to see many of the beautifully crafted effigies, monuments, and tombs. Many dignitaries in the same field are placed together. There is a musician's aisle, poet's corner, where more than 100 poets and writers are buried or have memorials, a section for scientists, various areas for royalty, and more. Here in the north aisle of the Lady Chapel is the tomb of Queen Elizabeth I. She was the daughter of King Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, was born in 1533 and died in 1603. She succeeded her half-sister Mary I in 1558, and Mary's coffin is directly beneath hers. Queen Elizabeth was the foundress of the present Collegiate Church of St. Peter, the formal title for the Abbey in 1560, and her long reign was one of the most revered in English history.
One of the most important graves in Westminster Abbey is the Grave of the Unknown Warrior. There is a plaque inside the red silk poppies which reads in part, Beneath this stone rests the body of a British warrior unknown by name or rank, brought from France to lie among the most illustrious of the land, and buried here on Armistice Day, 11 November 1920, in the presence of His Majesty King George V. Sir Isaac Newton was an English mathematician, physicist, and astronomer who formulated the theory of universal gravity. His monument was unveiled in 1731. The monument is made of white and gray marble. Its base bears a Latin inscription and supports a sarcophagus with large scroll feet and a relief panel. The relief depicts boys using instruments related to Newton's mathematical and optical work. Oh. Charles Darwin was an English naturalist who was known for his theory of evolution through natural selection. He was buried at the Abbey shortly after his death in 1882. Notice how plain it is. Mm This is the Parliament Building in London, England. And before I tell you about its history, and before we take a look inside, here's my summary of a great Parliament Building tour that we took. So we just finished the tour of the Houses of Parliament, which is also known as the Palace of Westminster. I thought the tour for some reason was gonna be 45 minutes, but it was actually an hour and 45 minutes. But it was a great tour, highly recommended. Um, they have it every Saturday because the Parliament is not in sessions on Saturday and that's the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Uh, get your tickets in advance before you come here. And there were a few things I thought were really interesting. Uh, one is the House of Commons was totally bombed out in World War II, and Winston Churchill uh, had it rebuilt, but he kept a small part of it where you can see the damage from the bombing. He just want to remind people of the horrors of World War II. The other thing that I thought was really fascinating was that the Prime Minister is not allowed in certain parts of the Parliament building and get this, the Queen of England is not allowed in certain parts of the Parliament building. So can you imagine the Queen wants to like see a different part and, and a, a security guard comes up to her, excuse me ma'am, but you're not allowed in there. So a security guard might have more power than the Queen of England inside the House of Parliament. <laughs> now some Parliament building history and then a look inside. The Parliament Building, also known as the Palace of Westminster, serves as the meeting place of the two Houses of the Parliament of the United Kingdom. The first is the House of Commons, which approves new laws and taxes, holds the government accountable, and debates the issues of the day. It has 640 members of Parliament, or MPs, who are elected by the people. The second house is the House of Lords, which has about 800 members, appointed because of their distinguished careers or because they have made an important contribution to British life. Its role is largely formal, it approves laws, appoints life peers, and announces the government's plans for the year ahead at the state opening ceremony. This building is commonly known as the Houses of Parliament after its occupants. The name the Palace of Westminster comes from the nearby Westminster Abbey, and it may refer to either of two structures. The Old Palace, a medieval building complex destroyed by fire in 1834, or its replacement, the New Palace, that stands today. The first royal palace constructed on the site dated from the 11th century, and Westminster became the primary residence of the kings of England until fire destroyed much of the complex in 1512. After that, it served as the home of the Parliament of England, which had met there since the 13th century, and also as the seat of the royal courts of justice. 
1834, an even greater fire ravaged the heavily rebuilt Houses of Parliament, and only a few medieval structures survived. The fire of 1834 was started when two workmen in the House of Lords threw a number of tally sticks, pieces of wood used for tax collection, into a furnace under the House of Lords chamber. The paneling above caught fire, and most of the Palace of Westminster was destroyed. Architect Charles Barry won a competition to rebuild the Parliament building with a design in the Gothic Revival style, specifically inspired by the English Perpendicular Gothic style of the 14th to 16th centuries. The remains of the old palace, except the detached jewel tower, were incorporated into its much larger replacement, which contains over 1,100 rooms, organized symmetrically around two series of courtyards, and which has a floor area of over a million square feet. Augustus Pugin, a leading authority on Gothic architecture and style, assisted Barry in designing the interior of the palace. Construction started in 1840 and lasted for 30 years, suffering delays and cost overruns, as well as the death of both leading architects. The House of Lords Chamber was ready by 1847 and the House of Commons Chamber by 1852. Work on the interior continued on and off well into the 20th century. Extensive repairs followed World War II, including the reconstruction of the Commons Chamber following its bombing in 1941. The Elizabeth Tower, which is often referred to by the name of its main bell, Big Ben, has become an iconic landmark of London and of the United Kingdom. Westminster Hall is the oldest building here. It survived the fire of 1834 and fires from World War II bombs in 1941. It was first built around 1100 and the lower walls date from then. Richard II remodeled the hall in the 14th century and most of the visible stonework dates from the 19th century. Work on the hammer beam timber roof started in 1393. It's the largest hammer beam roof in the world and the largest medieval unsupported roof in Northern Europe. No pillars were needed because of the way it was designed. A new steel structure was used in the early 20th century to provide support, and less than 10% of the timber was replaced. 26 carved angels form the lower part of the timber frame and bear the royal arms of the time. Over the centuries, this hall has been used for state ceremonies, including the lying in state of monarchs, royal councils, coronation feasts, and law courts. In fact, one famous early trial here was that of William Wallace, who led Scottish resistance to English King Edward I in the 1290s. He was portrayed by Mel Gibson in the movie Braveheart. St. Stephen's Hall stands on the site of the Royal Chapel of St. Stephen's, where the House of Commons sat from the mid-16th century until the chapel was destroyed by the fire of 1834. The hall's ten stained windows shows the coats of arms of cities and boroughs. The statues were installed in the 19th century, and the murals were painted and the mosaics were installed in the 1920s. So as you can see, or not see, Filming is prohibited everywhere inside the Houses of Parliament building, and photography is only allowed in Westminster Hall and St. Stephen's Hall. Having said that, we did get to see the House of Commons, the House of Lords, the Members' Lobby, the Peers' Lobby, and the elegant Prince's Chamber, Royal Gallery, and Robing Room. If you do make it to London in the future, this is a tour you should not miss. Hi, this is Danny T, host of Manny's Awesome Adventures, and welcome to London, England. Now, in back of me is the iconic Parliament building, and of course, Big Ben. And in about 10 seconds, we're gonna hear Big Ben chime. So I've been looking forward to this for like weeks, months. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Bloody hell, there's no Big Ben. They kidnapped Big Ben. What happened to Big Ben? Big Ben is gone. Oh my god. I flew 5,000 miles just to hear Big Ben chime, and there's no Big Ben. What is going on? Well, there's only one person in this nation that can make Big Ben chime, and that is Her Majesty the Queen. 
So I am going to go back to Buckingham Palace. I've already been there twice this week, but I'm gonna to try to get an audience with Her Majesty the Queen so that Big Ben will chime while I'm still in London. But if not, it's still a magnificent building, the Parliament building, the House of Parliament. And whatever that structure on the right is, I can't even recognize it. But we are in London, England, and it's a beautiful city. So even without Big Ben chiming, we're still gonna have fun.